Hello, I'm Janice Karen, Director of Policy, Technology, and Innovation at the Massachusetts Health Data Consortium, or MHDC. I run our Data Governance Collaborative, also known as the DGC. We start each of our weekly meetings with a series of industry quick updates to learn about new and proposed regulations, laws, standards, industry initiatives, and other activity. Join us for this week's updates. And if you'll go to the first slide, please. First update. So ONC has put out what they're calling a quick stat on patient comfort with sharing social needs data. This is like their data briefs, except it only has one question and data point. And basically what they are showing is that of the patients surveyed in 2022, they don't indicate how many people were in this survey or what the you know, who, who the um, cohort was, but about 60% of patients indicated that they were comfortable and that would be an, a response of either very comfortable or somewhat comfortable with sharing food insecurity, housing insecurity, or transportation issues with their providers for treatment purposes. They did not provide any other data or context. So um, in addition to not providing information on the cohort, they did not provide data on the type of treatments or interventions that they were comfortable with or whether they are comfortable uh, with providers sharing the data. And with a, re a reminder that once US CDI version three becomes the baseline data sharing standard, that includes SDOH data. So that data will be able to be shared without, without consent. And in fact, will be required to be shared without consent in many circumstances. So you can find the specific statistics there. I actually have given you more information than what is there, but if you'd like to follow it and see this in a nice little bar graph, feel free. Any questions or comments there? All right, let's move on to the next thing. ONC has also put out a new Tufka blog piece, uh, basically with a status update. It mentions that there are six organizations that have been selected as QHINs. It talks about the common agreement version 1.1 that's been released. Uh, that is not, that just has some minor updates. Um, but then it talks about the common agreement version two that is expected in spring of 2024. This version is expected to add some basic fire support. The blog piece is really an overview piece. It doesn't go into a lot of information. So if you'd like some more information, I recommend following up on the Sequoia website or just uh, staying tuned for additional updates, which we will be bringing you. But you can find the blog piece at the URL there. Any questions, comments, thoughts? All right, let's move on then. This was really interesting. This came out yesterday, um, <clears throat> although I think the letter was sent a week or, week or two ago, but the FTC sent a letter to the US Copyright Office that talked about its intention to provide consumer protections against the misuse of AI. And it talks about, in addition to some of what it's doing, it talks about the role that it thinks the Copyright Office should play in this area. And so it talked about things like privacy violations and automation of biases and discrimination and turbocharging deceptive practices, making imposter schemes easier and other ways that AI could be used for fraud. But then it specifically talked about some copyright related things, um, such as protecting the rights of copyright holders to compete in a fair market and protecting consumers from fraud or being misled about the authorship of a work. That is not strictly only um, like having someone uh, literally plagiarize, but there's also issues around thinking that content comes out from generative AI uh, that isn't accurately attributed, things like that. And so I think I did not have a chance to read the entire letter because it's actually fairly lengthy. Um, but I did take, I read the press release and I did look at some of the letter and it's really interesting. And I definitely, if you're interested in these areas, I definitely recommend taking a look. You can find the, both the press release and the actual letter linked in the slide. And anyone have any questions or thoughts there?
All right. Well, it's definitely something I'll be keeping an eye on because it's a very interesting area that hadn't necessarily been something I had been thinking about before this popped up. All right, let's move on then. FTC also put out some new draft guidance on off-level, off-label research sharing to providers. So this is not necessarily directly applicable to most of the folks here, but um, basically, this is on what information, research studies, uh, drafts of things are allowed to be sent to providers to try to encourage them to use FDA approved drugs and medical devices for off-label usage. So that's a very specific thing, but it's very interesting. And if you're interested in that area, you can find an article that really talks about the, gu the guidance in some detail, as well as the actual draft guidance in those links. Any questions or comments there? All right, moving on. Uh, so November 1st had a lot of legislative action um, in the health area. Um, in the House of Representatives. And so there were three bills that were reported out of committee, which doesn't mean anything's going to happen with them, but means that they are eligible to be put to be discussed and voted on by the full House. So the three bills were the Transparency and Billing Act, which says that, um, and, and these are just really a very high level overview, obviously, but that group health plans only have to pay bills from hospitals that have policies and procedures to ensure accurate billing. Obviously, if that goes any further, that will require a great deal of examination because that that is an interesting area that could upend things entirely. But as a, you know, so if that goes further, we'll obviously look at that in more detail. But uh, that's an interesting interesting one. Um, Hidden Fee Disclosure Act strengthens the disclosure requirements for employee-sponsored health plans around fees. I think that one seems like it's uh, somewhat of a no-brainer, and I would say that one is has a decent chance, but who knows. And then the last one is the Health Data Act, which requires that health plan fiduciaries um, have access to de-identified claims um, and data related to value-based payments and more. And the data related to value-based payments may have, it was not clear that that how, how de-identified everything has to be. Um, depending on the structure of the plan, this may include employers. So there's some potential privacy issues that came to my mind immediately here. And I have not read not seen enough to know how they're being handled. Um, but that's another one that if that moves further, we'll take a closer look at it and keep an eye on that. Any questions, comments, thoughts there? Yeah, who's supposed to make the determination that hospitals have policies and procedures to ensure accurate billing? Is it is it the institution's it, own auditors? Is it- uh, It's, it's uh, not clear at this point. It might be, I have- uh, if that moves forward, we'll definitely take a closer look. Or uh, let me actually make a note to report back on that. Take a look and report back anyway uh, on what's the current on the current draft language around that. All right. Anyone have anything else? or any other comment or anything else you'd like me to try to get more information about for a future discussion. All right, then I will take that note and try to, I will look at that in more detail and report back and we'll move on for now. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, also from the, uh, this one from the Senate, uh, there's a new healthcare cybersecurity working group um, that is underneath the HELP committee. Uh, Bill Cassidy 
Mark Warner, John Cornyn, and Maggie Hassan, two Democratic senators, two Republican senators, started this new work group on November 2nd. And the idea is that they will look in more detail and propose possible legislative solutions on cybersecurity in healthcare um, and public health to the HELP Committee. You can find a press release about this at that link. So another thing to keep an eye on. Any comments, thoughts, questions there? All right, next slide. So the uh, you may remember that, that this group spent some time a couple months ago looking at a proposed CMS rule that included price transparency among a bunch of other things. Uh, we believe this is the final version of that rule that it has come out. It will be published in the Federal Register on November 22nd, and its effective date is January 1st, 2024. Now, it's not clear. I've not had a chance to look at the rule in detail. This also just, uh, just came out. It was just released in preview this week. Uh, and it, so it's not clear yet. Don't know if there's any change from the proposed rule that we reviewed. Um, if it is remotely similar to that, this is an awful lot of stuff to change in less than two months. So that's something it's not clear if there will be any kind of enforcement delay or uh, exactly how that will work. But if this is really officially going in the Federal Register on November 22nd, and it is expect it is effective on January 1st. That's a lot. <laughs> you know, obviously there's all the holidays in there. D November 22nd, if I remember correctly, is the day before Thanksgiving. So that includes Thanksgiving, that includes all of the December holidays, the, you know, and then obviously it goes into effect on January 1st. So perhaps there's some discussion in the section specific to price transparency that provides a later date for that section. Um, but we'll have to take a look at that further as well. Any other questions, thoughts, comments here? All right, let's uh, move on. And if you'll pause there for a moment. I hope you learned a lot from our quick updates. If you're interested in finding out more about the DGC and its other activities, email me at dgc at myhealthdata.org. That email address is also on your screen.